Hmm. We had like a day of spring. It was kind of exciting, huh? Was it Sunday? Saturday? Yeah, we're all like, yes. And then it's like, no, just kidding. It's going to be really windy and cold again. <laughs> but it was really nice. And I don't know about you all, but um, I came down Folsom biking and those trees are so beautiful. And it's like overnight, they went from having no leaves to being in bloom. It's just, yeah, that's really uh, lifts my heart to see it. Um, and this evening, we are once again progressing and making our way through old path white clouds. And tonight, there's, there's a really short little stanza that I want us to spend some time on. Um, it's the fire sermon. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's considered one of the first three teachings of the Buddha. Um, and for those who haven't been here, I'll give us some background. And for our practice tonight, we'll start with a practice, but we're going to do a little bit of like a slow lead in to practice tonight. Sometimes it's really great to just drop into practice like, oh, like we're here. Let's focus on our breath. But there's certain practices where I feel like, what's a good analogy? Like we kind of want to prime the pump. We want to get our imagination going. We actually want to kind of get a feel, like a heart feel for the practice before we get into it. And our practice tonight will be one, a very simple practice of equanimity with the breath. And I'm really calling on the inspiration of Thich Nhat Hanh. So he is the the author of this book who put together all of these beautiful teachings. Um, and one of his like most simple uh, teaching of all time, maybe many of you have even practiced this before. I know we have a teacher, um, Augusta, who sits on Monday and is in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, but breathing in, I dwell in the present moment, breathing out, I know this is a wonderful moment. Like such a simple, such a beautiful practice. And it really invites us to that, that felt experience of equanimity. Because breathing in, we're really tethering ourselves to this moment. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment. Not fixated, you know, but like just like I'm inhabiting it. Like it's the most beautiful palace I've ever been in. I dwell in this present moment. And breathing out. I know this is a wonderful moment. It's just, it's just a really, a really sweet one. And um, I was, have been looking at equanimity recently, especially um, trying to find resources that make it simple. Who finds equanimity simple? Anybody? It actually is, but it's really complicated in the way we describe it. Um, and, and that's what I, I love about that simple instruction that we'll practice together. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment. Breathing out, I know this is a wonderful moment. And in looking up resources around equanimity um, and different teachings and different readings, I found just this really beautiful practice, this little audio practice by Thich Nhat Hanh. And he is really using the definition of equanimity as kind of non-discriminating wisdom. Sometimes it's called even heartedness. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to describe equanimity. It's often associated with the sense of balance. But when um, I was looking further, I found this beautiful quote. And this is the quote I thought might kind of help us ease in to the practice together. Um, I want to give the right attribution to this quote. So this is from Bhikkhu. Analayo. Anybody know Bhikkhu Analayo? Kind of a well-known Buddhist teacher. Yep, I see some thumbs up online. And he gives this analogy for the four immeasurables. So when we think of equanimity, we're very often thinking of, well, yeah, that's that one that happens after all the fun ones that are, you know, emotional and somewhat um, in some ways like easier to touch, easier to feel. And in his description, he's just he has that. Each of these four measurable practices is, is like the sun in different ways. And he says, metta is like the sun at noon. So the sense of loving kindness, it's so strong and it shines on everyone. And he says, karuna or compassion, it's like the setting sun. We're meeting the unknown of, of the night. 
um, with tenderness and care. And then mudita, or our empathetic joy, it's like the sunrise, that sense of rejoicing in everything, inspiration rising. And equanimity is like the full moon reflecting the light of the sun in a vast cloudless night. So equanimity is the full moon reflecting the light of the sun in a vast cloudless night. Just really, it really moved me, right? So within equanimity, there is the radiances of loving kindness, of compassion and empathetic joy, but it's, it's able to hold this bigger or vaster view. And I think the practice of equanimity, the way that it has really resonated for me is experiencing and knowing that I'm only able to, in any given moment, understand a small part of what's happening, right? So what I'm able to kind of grok in any certain situation, it's only one part. There's just so much more in every direction. So I, I really like this idea of with equanimity, we can really kind of have this wider view and maybe get a sense of the complexity and the scope of all things. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, the actual like root word of equanimity, it has two different parts of it. It's like seeing all around. It's like that real sense of spaciousness. And one of the practices I really enjoy with equanimity is, is this kind of, um, you know, a mindfulness of phenomena but really experiencing phenomena just as it is. So if we hear, we just let it be sound, not the motorcycle, not the neighbors, just sound. And if we you know, experience warmth of our hand or maybe coolness from the wind blowing past our, our cheek, we just let it be sensation. But in our practice, I want us to keep it really simple. Like let's make the equanimity simple. So I'm gonna just say that definition one more time to just, again, like let it land in us before we sit in practice together. So metta is like the sun at noon, bright and strong of loving kindness shining on everyone. Karuna or compassion is like the sunset, meeting the unknown of the evening with a sense of tenderness and care. And mudita, this empathetic joy, is like the sunrise lifting our heart with inspiration. And equanimity is the full moon reflecting the light of the sun in a vast cloudless night. So let's find a posture that will support our practice. Giving ourselves a moment to really settle into our practice seat, into the dignity of sitting in practice together. We can give ourselves a moment to maybe lean over to the left a little, or lean to the right, kind of lean forward, a little backwards, and just giving ourselves that fluid mo motion and movement, and then finding our kind of center point where we have a sense of a really nice upright spine, that sense of being a tall lily. And then inviting a sense of ease through the front of the body, ease and relaxation through the forehead and the eyes. Ease and relaxation through the cheekbones and the jaw. And continuing to invite that ease through the chest and the belly. And for this practice, you're welcome to have your eyes closed if that's comfortable. 
or also to have them slightly open with a soft gaze. And while for those of us sitting in the center together, we may hear sounds from the street, we can have a sense of real care and protection from Mace who's sitting at the door. She's really holding our Dharma gate right now so that we can all be here together. Maybe feeling that sense of the ground beneath us as that extra support, that protection. We could almost think of it like a sense of love coming up from below us, ready to hold our weight, our fears, our joys, our sorrows. And as we ring the bell to begin, allowing our mind to just fully follow the resonant sound of the bell. Let's begin by settling our body in its natural state. A natural state of being still. Feeling as though that stillness it drops us all the way down. Shifting the energy from the mind down to the belly and sits bones. And giving our whole body and nervous system some time here to just settle into stillness and settle into stillness and settle even more deeply into stillness. without a lot of effort, simply noticing the body with this invitation to still. We may notice that there's actually a sense of coursing energy within the body, the subtle body. We may become aware of energy in our face, in our chest, in our hands, in our belly. Just continuing to invite this quality of stillness in the body and allowing whatever is experienced in the body to just be as it is.
it's okay if earlier parts of the day are coming into your consciousness, if your attention gets grabbed away here and there. And just keep on coming back for a bit longer, this initial phase of settling into the body. Inviting this posture of stillness, both a physical posture and also a mental posture. And that stillness, like the very bottom of the ocean. There can be waves and movement above, but all the way down, the stillness. And building on the stillness, we invite the mind to settle into its natural state. This quality of openness. Feeling the mind, not just as our thoughts, feelings that are coming and going. But that truly spacious awareness that can be experienced above us and below us, all around us. Feel or imagine the spaciousness and openness of mind throughout the entire body, and yet not limited to the body. While this stillness and openness can be deeply relaxing, really find the sense of vividness within the openness. The brightness of our awareness shining through. If you're feeling dull or lethargic, you could give yourself a moment to focus a bit more on the inhale, finding that vividness through the inhale. If the mind feels too busy and still winding down, give yourself that exhale to relax. So 
giving ourselves this time to continue being in the openness and the stillness, yet applying this introspective awareness as needed, more vividness or more ease through the breath. And with the stillness and openness, we invite the speech, the inner speech, to also settle into its natural state. Finding and connecting to a sense of silence. Not the silence from our outer environment, but this choice. This inward ability to simply be with the openness, the stillness, without concept, without story. Nothing else to do, nowhere else to go in this moment. Just a couple more moments here. Really feeling the the potential of this experience of stillness and openness and silence. Even if it's only glimpses between thoughts and memories and images. Noticing the impact on the body. Maybe the body feels more spacious, maybe the body almost feels like it's made of light. Maybe it simply feels more present, more connected. Just a bit longer here, settling our body, speech and mind in their natural states.
without leaving this sense of being settled in our body, speech, and mind. Let's invite in this, this beautiful flavor of that high noon sun of loving kindness. We can just feel the ember or spark at our heart of this aspiration of wishing ourselves and all other beings to know happiness and its true causes. And seeing if that lands in the heart. And as though it were this little ember, just with our breath, imagining that we could extend and radiate this wish of loving kindness. If it's just a mental thought and not a feeling, no problem. And without bringing anyone or anything in particular to mind, just working with this feeling, this expression of the heart's aspiration, loving kindness for all beings. And then imagining that bright, high sun shining down with loving kindness. Starting to set, having that golden light, that warmth of compassion. And connecting with the heartfelt aspiration that ourselves and all beings could be free from suffering and know the true causes of suffering feeling that ember and again just imagine radiating that compassion out breath by breath almost feel like the body is a lantern glowing with this light of compassion. And without needing to push away our loving kindness or compassion, just inviting in this other layer, this sun rising, this inspiration of empathetic joy, a rejoicing with the goodness all around us, letting our heart be lifted with the virtues of others 
these beautiful trees in bloom, people being of service, feeling connected. Again, just the ember of mudita and radiating the sense of rejoicing with the goodness of our world. And now inviting this sense of all these radiances being held in a greater and vaster view, reflected upon the moon in the cloudless night in the vast sky. In equanimity, we can hold it all, the joys and the challenges, the excitements, the worries. We can break down any barriers we feel in our heart towards parts of ourselves, other beings. A sense of loving acceptance with what is. A joyful surrender to life as it is. Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment. Breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment. Breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. With that in-breath, it's as though we are fully inhabiting, experiencing 
this very moment. And by fully experiencing the moment, we recognize it is a wonderful moment. Severing and cutting through our habitual ways of wanting the next thing, trying to get rid of this other thing, dwell here, this moment, and find its intrinsic goodness. Reconnecting with the body and posture. Maybe it's more possible to feel upright and at ease. And whenever the mind gets carried away, just relax, release, and return to just dwelling in this present moment and finding its wonder. When the bell rings to bring our practice to a close, we don't stop. We keep going, dwelling in the present moment, knowing it's a wonderful moment. Thank you for your practice. Ooh, I needed that. Oh boy. It's amazing how over the course of a day, in my experience, I can like live outside my body, like a couple feet above my head, I think. And uh, it just feels very good to come home. Any reflections or thoughts or questions on that practice? See some nice smiles, that's good. Yeah, man, do you mind coming up and using the mic? Or you can even like drag it back to you. Okay. Yeah, Vegas style. Yeah, um, am I in 
the way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a couple months since I've been here. Um, last time I was here, we were all wearing masks. Um, I've been on like medical leave and like it's been stormy. So I wanted to do an in-person meditation. Um, sometimes meditation can be so isolating. And I've always used a practice to, uh, you know, like ease rumination and like cultivate compassion. And now that it's spring and I want to connect, it's been nice to use the meditation practice for social anxiety. Hmm. And I thought this was so fitting um to just dwell in the moments when I'm like social and this was just a great in-person meditation for this year and mm. so I just wanted to share that and it's great to be back so nice to see you yeah thank, thank you for much. sharing that yeah it's again I don't know about you you all and your experience or exposure with Thich Nhat Han, but it really feels like it's the simplicity. Like it's like these really small little things that go so far in his teachings. It's so beautiful. I just, and it's, I do think you could probably meditate on that single instructional phrase of dwelling in the present moment, knowing it's a wonderful moment. It's um, yeah, really profound or could be. Anyone else? questions reflections makes sure you coming through anyway you got something to say oh it is a little cold yeah any other thoughts questions reflections uh, I just really thought that like, mm. yeah. Did did you all online hear Diane? Did you guys hear? <laughs> Cage was saying that she really felt the uh, empathetic joy with the sunrise, <clears throat> that sense of lifting. And um, I should say a a, a long time Dharma friend, uh, Thupkin Leshki, is a monk who lives in Australia. He was kind of talking me through this idea of um, kind of non-object based Brahma Viharas or heart practices and just bringing the essence and then radiating essence, um, which I think is it's, it's simple. Um, and I've been practicing with it a bit. It's not as quite as like juicy, right, as bringing to mind someone we know who's suffering or someone we want to be joyful but there's that essence is already there and it gets us a little less busy. You know, sometimes we get busy when we're like, who should I choose? And Oh, that person, this door, you know, it just, there's stuff to do. Um, so yeah. Any thoughts on that or just kind of bringing the essence or the ember of that without a person, without an object or a subject. Yeah. Jimmy. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, that idea really resonates. That, that idea of um, be, just feeling into the, the loving kindness and feeling into the compassion and the empathetic joy, you know, without, like you said, without a particular object or person or situation in mind, and having, yet yeah, having an, an understanding of the, the differences hmm. of those feelings of that kind of, uh, love, friendly regard, care for suffering, and being really stoked that somebody else is having a good day, you know, without it being tied into anybody in particular, mm. that generates, for me, a sense of equanimity. Yeah. Because I don't have to think about Mm -hmm. in, in a discursive 
kind of way. Yeah. And um, the equanimity is holding all of that without, without giving a shit about it too much. Yeah. But not being, you know, nihilistic about it in this sort of, you know, uncaring kind of way, but just that acceptance and balance of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm, I think the first time I did practices with the Brahma Viharas, um, these four immeasurables, without a person, what I realized was sometimes when I'm doing the practices for someone, it can get a little transactional even like I, and there's this, like, I, I get the satisfaction, like, Oh yeah. Like, Oh, that, oh, I'm going to go for them. Oh, that feels, good. you know? And even though like, I don't know, there's just a, there's just like, I was kind of catching on to myself a little with how that practice to me, it was getting, a little hooked in this idea of like what I was giving and how so nice that I was doing it. Or like, I don't know, there was like something a little tricky. Um, and I still, you know, find it like incomparably beneficial, you know, to, to, especially to be with, um, be with difficulty. I find that compassion and mudita are, are far more common for me than, than loving kindness. I, maybe loving kindness just feels like it's kind of always around, but that being able to apply those um, in the face of suffering and in the potential of something being great and rejoicing or something that I like feel jealous of, right? Oh, so many opportunities. It's like really at the core of insecurity. It's like, oh, what do they have? God, it must be better. And then being able to have empathetic joy instead is so freeing. Um, and equanimity, you know, it's like equanimity feels like it's the fruition, you know, of those practices. It's feeling those um, those different ways that we can kind of respond to the emotions they, of daily life. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted us to just spend another moment or two uh, thinking about or talking about equanimity. It is a tricky term, but pretty much every chapter in this book is about equanimity. In like, I don't know, how many chapters? 50 chapters? In like 50 different ways. Um, 66 chapters. Yeah. I know. We got a little way to go. We're on 30. We're fine. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear anyone um, who'd be willing to share on, you know, like what equanimity is, is feeling like, what equanimity is bringing forth, of how you work with it, how you think about it um, in terms of your daily practice. Maybe what's hard about the concept or idea. It's a, it's a really, um, I feel like it's a very flexible idea in a way. It can mean a lot of things. Um, so yeah, be curious to hear from folks. Anyone online interested in this pop quiz, equanimity? What is it? Why do it? I found the, she might speak out that. Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I found the um, image of the full moon to be extremely evocative and very helpful, and mm -hmm. um, in terms of equanimity. And you know, we had a full moon last week, and as I walked from the bar station to my home, and it was shining up above, and, and there was something about the radiance that mm. the sun is like particular. You know, you can see particular things, yeah. and you have particular feelings about them. Yeah. The moon sort of shrouds mm -hmm. everything in the same kind of gray, silverish color. Mm. And so it felt like that there's an impartiality, like, so to, to mm -hmm. uh, bring that image to mind, um, feels like it, it really coincides with my, what I think equanimity should be like, mm. if I wanted it to, you know, if, yeah. if I could say that. Yeah. That kind of way. And yeah. And there was something also like Venus is up in the Western sky in the evening and shining bright, and, but the moon, which is like, spectacular but the moon has this kind of softness mm. to it that i find um really coincides with a sense of equanimity from uh yeah the way i'd like it to be mm. so thank you for so that. beautiful yeah i mean i think equanimity is one of those terms that's 
maybe best described through poetry and you were really describing it poetically, you know, the, mm, the feeling and the quality and the light. And there's a beautiful teacher, uh, maybe some of you know, actually a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, Cairo Jewel Lingo. And she writes about equanimity and, and describes it like in this cool quality, this kind of coolness, which um, not cold and indifferent, but this coolness. And, um, you know, she really highlights that it's, it has an aspect of inclusivity. Right. That's kind of its fundamental, even though the compassion is for all beings <clears throat> with the with the equanimity, it's like the real sense of like everything, everything being with everything. Um, thank you. Denise, Did I see something? Yeah, Denise oh, raised yeah. her hand. OK, great. Denise, do you want to share? That for me, I was in a safe place to talk. I'm sorry, Eve. I'm not in a proper container. I don't know if you can no hear problem. me. Okay. We I, can hear I, you. And I think the metaphors before beautifully, more beautifully said what I was thinking of. But I was just so struck by the, the water, being in the water and going down. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of diving. And you know, when the water kind of supports you as you go down, and somehow equanimity came in with that. And it just, um, it, I'm just not going to think about it in the same way anymore. It's, it's beautiful in a whole different way. I love that you gave us all these different metaphors. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> and it is, it's so funny, like putting words to these feelings. It's a little bit awkward. And yet, um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to really reflect on our experience. So often I'll speak for myself. I'm like doing a meditation practice and then I'm moving on like next thing. Right. But what is it like to give ourselves, especially in Sangha, the time to reflect, you know, and really notice. And it's also okay. You know, if your mind was extra busy or extra tired, it's um, you know, that's of course also part of our practice together. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts or reflections on equanimity? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Equanimity is very close for me to I'm trying to, again, putting it into words is tough. Um, it's kind of like a benevolent, um, spacious acceptance. I, I don't know. I mean, th that's what I'm wondering, because it's very close to calm abiding and open yeah space. it's kind of a just an openness and acceptance but i don't know if it's if there's a difference there's definitely a positive feeling tone yeah but yeah how does it feel if it does how would it feel different is it that positive feeling tone in the body yes. or mind yeah. yeah that's the difference is the is yeah. the positive feeling tone and, and and the word that comes to mind is acceptance yeah. And not like a resignation, right? Like I think I said, joyful surrender, like, okay, you know, like my wisdom posture is bowing down, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. And I do think, you know, with calm abiding, you know, there's such a beautiful relationship with equanimity, you know, what can really support our equanimity um, is that calm abiding. And I, I really, it just... It's really amazing how easy it is to forget, you know, that the sun is the light of the moon. Like that kind of is, feels mind blowing. And, you know, this idea that, you know, equanimity, it's, it's even though it has this cool light within it, are those radiances, that warmth of the compassion and the joy and the loving kindness. Um, it's just not being quite so pulled to one or the other. You know, I, I, um, I sometimes almost think of it like it's the it's the puppeteer holding these other um, aspects. And I really consider these four measurable practices kind of like an apothecary. You know, we are applying them as needed to these different areas of our life. And maybe, you know, equanimity is kind of. I don't know, it's interesting. I don't think it's the, um, you know, the herbalist behind the counter, but it it's. It gives us more uh, more information and more knowledge about what we are responding to or how we are responding. So, 
Yeah, thank you. Don't worry, there'll be another pop quiz on equanimity soon if you would like to um, talk about it. But yeah, just, yeah. And it's, <laughs> especially if you're having, you know, a difficult emotional experience or going through a difficult time, um, it feels like equanimity can be so far away, you know, if we're activated and, and yet when we can experience it, it's almost, it doesn't like erase what has happened, but it just feels like such a truth. Um, yeah, really interesting to com continue exploring. Um, but we'll move on here to, to the fire sermon or the fire sutra. So for, for those of you who have been gone or um, maybe coming for a first time, we are tracking this chapter by chapter, Old Path, White Clouds. And this is how Thich Nhat Hanh put together all of the historical aspects of the Buddha's life from different sources around the world. He definitely like, you know, um, uses like specific ways of describing things that I, I often am looking at other sources at the same time. So when we did the, the night here where we looked at the evening of his awakening, um, it was, it was like, it was missing some key parts that I like. So sometimes adding in extra flavor, but right now we are we're actually only, um, a couple months after the Buddha's awakening. So he, you know, spent years looking for a teacher that would be able to guide him in this path of awakening until he realized that he actually had to find it on his own. Just so ironic that now Buddhism is taught by teachers everywhere. And yet Buddha's like, teachers don't help. Um, find it on your own, um, which makes me feel a lot better because I'm just, my crone happens to be here, but we're all finding it on our own together. Um, and, you know, this sense of, once he's discovered this awakening by seeing dependent origination, like really seeing how everything is connected, he starts like finding his people. Um, he starts developing the Sangha. And one of the kind of big groups, it ends up being a 900 a new disciples almost um, at once, is when he finds this group that are fire worshipers. Now, it's a group of ascetics who are living by the river in the town of Uruvela, where he first um, woke up. And they are led by these three brothers, the Kasapa brothers. And in their entire kind of worldview, they put fire at the center. Fire is the beginning and the middle and the end. Fire is the reason we worship fire. Fire is everything. And last week, what we were going over um, together was this beautiful dialogue between the Buddha and one of these brothers. And the Buddha is really challenging him, like, why fire? Isn't fire made up of a lot of things? What about water? Right, like really kind of um, poking holes in this kind of one thing could be the thing approach, as opposed to, you know, what he's really teaching that everything, all things. And when the, the brother um, kind of succumbs to the wisdom of the Buddha and really sees what, kind of what he's been teaching, he just breaks down and, and is crying and says, wow, please accept me as your student. And the Buddha says, well, what about your 500 students? He's like, give me two hours. <laughs> and he goes and he's like, they're all your students now too, let's go. And uh, what's really interesting, you know, the Buddha starts teaching and everybody in this, um, in this group, they all had very long hair. So they all, you know, shaved their heads, threw their hair into the river, threw away all their ornamental objects for prayer. Cause you know, you don't need the ritual objects or you don't need anything else, just your practice. But the younger brother lived down the river. So the younger brother saw all these like ponytails and ritual objects. And I was like, Oh my God. So the younger brother comes up the river and is like, what happened? And he finds all his newly bald friends uh, and the Buddha. And again, it's like, give me an hour or two. Comes back. He's like, all right, you've got 300 more disciples. <laughs> and they're like, let's go get the third brother and just round it out. So this is Buddha's first sermon to 900 new students. And 
kind of a side note, but really interesting about Kasapa and his two brothers. They're all Kasapa um, is their last name, but they are very well organized. And, and Thich Nhat Hanh puts like a lot of effort into writing about how they organized this 900. You know, they had the senior teachers and each senior teacher who was a truly senior teacher had a group of um, 50 but the junior senior teachers would have groups of 30 and everybody sat together on Sundays and like, just really interesting. Like it wasn't, you know, it was a very easeful, very organic, very grassroots. And yet there was a lot of order um, that was put into um, getting everybody trained. And what we'll see, you know, across these next chapters is as Buddha's encountering many other religious groups with religious leaders. Um, he finds that the most senior students in those areas, they're really ripe for awakening. So maybe they find the Buddha and they've only, you know, just started learning his teachings, but they are so close to awakening. And there could be another member of the Sangha who's been there, you know, six months, but who's just learning. So the senior teacher isn't on um, just being there a long time. It's actually being kind of like how close you are to awakening. And that's something that is visible to Buddha, one of his many kind of special powers, what are called cities, able to really kind of see into the hearts and the awakening of others. Um, and so in this sermon, da, da, da. so I'll just read it out. And it's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful to think that a truly realized teacher could give a sermon this simple and maybe the conditions were right and, you know, everything like your lifetimes of practice allowed you to be in that Sangha where, where Buddha showed up, but that it could just so deeply hit you that it could really shift your entire life, you know, just a couple lines. So no pressure, but hope you have a really big experience. Um, one day after all the bhikkhus had returned from begging, the Buddha summoned them to gather on the slopes of the mountain. 900 bhikkhus ate in silence, a bhikkhu is just monk, ate in silence with the Buddha and the three Kasapa brothers. When they were finished eating, they all turned their gaze to the Buddha. Sitting serenely on a large rock, the Buddha began to speak. Bhikkhus, all dharmas are on fire. What is on fire? The six sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, they're all on fire. The six objects of the senses, form, sound, smell, taste, touch, and objects of mind, all on fire. The six consciousnesses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, feeling, and thought are all on fire. They are burning from the flames of desire, hatred, and illusion. They are burning from the flames of birth, old age, sickness, and death. And from the flames of pain, anxiety, frustration, worry, fear, and despair. Bhikkhus, every feeling is burning, whether it is unpleasant or pleasant or neutral. Feelings arise and are conditioned by the sense organs, objects of the sense organs and sense consciousnesses. Feelings are burning from the flames of desire, hatred, and illusion. Feelings are burning from the flames of birth, old age, sickness, and death. And from the flames of pain, anxiety, frustration, worry, fear, and despair. Bhikkhus, do not allow yourself to be consumed by the flames of desire, hatred, and illusion. See the impermanent and interdependent nature of all dharmas in order to not be enslaved by the cycle of birth and death created by the sense organs, objects of the senses, and the sense consciousnesses. 900 bhikkhus listened intently. Each was deeply moved. They were happy to know they had found the path that taught how to look deeply in order to attain liberation. Faith welled in the heart of every bhikkhu. The Buddha remained for three months to teach these new bhikkhus, and they made great progress. The Kasapa brothers were talented assistants to the Buddha. They helped him guide and teach the Sangha. And so this really simple and kind of short sermon is what's called the fire sermon. It's, it's this idea that 
we can overcome and transcend not the pain of everyday life, but the suffering. That it is really in not only how we are experiencing the world, um, but everything that we apply to our experience of the world that creates our suffering. And it's interesting to use this word fire. Um, I think craving feels like fire, right? Craving can really feel like that burning desire. Um, it's interesting on Sunday, some of you know, we're having Lama Sultra Malioni come and she does this beautiful practice of feeding your demons that uh, Lopan Chandra also teaches here. And, you know, craving is a big demon that, that people are feeding. We did a research study and, um, years ago here and craving was one of the main topics that people were just feeling and, and the pain of it and wanting to be rid of it. And I think we often associate craving with one kind of, you know, substance, right? Oh yeah. People who crave, you know, they have, they have a substance dependence or a substance use issue. Craving is all around us, all around us. And I think until we get a little more um, honest with ourselves about our craving, there's no way we can start to feel that fire. And not fire like mm, good fire, like fire, like burning, hot, you know, pain fire. Um, you know, you know, this morning, just like super simple example. Um, I went out to get a um I know I talk about pastries a lot in this class, but let's just be real. Like pastries are so good. I went out to get this pastry. Um and I definitely had a lot of craving, like anticipatory enjoyment craving. Like this is going to be awesome. And like I had enough time to do it. And, you know, I try to like be smart about when I eat sugar. because I'm like a hippie or whatever. And um, I'm really excited about it. And I get this pastry and I sit outside and like the street cleaning vehicle comes. And it's like so loud. And it's like a little windy. And like, I cannot appreciate even this thing I'm like craving, like it's totally not giving me what I need and I'm suffering. <laughs> like big suffering, but you know, and it's just like, I just like everything in the way of like this thing I like, oh, like needed, wanted, it was gonna like make whatever ever stress in my life go away. And I was like, that's, this is hilarious, you know? And I like went inside and then someone's like talking loud on their phone. I was like, oh, humans or like, whatever. It's just, uh, it's really interesting, you know? And like, if I hadn't been like so fixated on this thing I needed that would make me feel good, would I have been so miserable? Probably not, you know? So that's my very small um, admission of craving for today, at least. Yeah, curious, what does craving, like what does that bring up for you all when you hear that, like, how do you burn? Like, I guess if I looked at this list, that was definitely burning through uh, hearing um, and through the sense com consciousness of hearing um, and objects of mind, like my just, I was just like, I just, it felt so wrong. Um, yeah, it was so interesting that I just couldn't be with the experience of finally getting this object of craving or so much put on top of it. So, yeah. Anyone else? Like what, what comes to mind when you think of that burning of craving? How does it create disturbance or how do you work with that sense? Are you even aware that you crave things? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, so how it feels is really like torture for me. Um, I have noticed that um, I have some addiction to um, keeping it, you know, because it's entertaining and that part feels good. But then towards you know the end, it's really torturous. Yeah. Um, but how I work with it, I don't know actually because um, I bounce between t 
two states of either entertaining and keeping it Mm -hmm. and giving it more branches and, you know, like uh, enjoying it (laughs) until, you know, it doesn't fulfill and then it's a very big disappointment. Yeah. Um, So either entertain or I would um, try to get rid of it. But I don't think either of those work. So I don't know how to um, lightly hold it, if that's the way. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, sometimes uh, it just, as in a miracle, it's easy. And, you know, like I'm not fixated on something or things. Yeah. And it's a flow and it's, you know, more yes. enjoyable. Yeah. But I don't know how that happens. I'm so, I'm so glad you said that last part that like sometimes it just is able to flow, right? Like sometimes it's not that clenched fist. It is that open hand. And I think, I mean, for myself this morning, like I didn't sleep well last night. I have this family member who's not well, like there's stuff that was making my craving. I mean, I like went to get the thing I craved because I was like, I don't feel good. You know? And so when are we leaning towards the thing we're craving? And again, like how are we not, um, like what's contributing to the, to the grasping of it. Cause you know, right. Like you, it sounds like you're very clear on, yeah, I see this as it is. And it's not absolutely not about never getting it. It's like, I'm not giving up pastries for the record. No, I'm just kidding. But like, um, we don't need to like give it up. Right. But it is like giving up that obsession. Um, And the obsession, you know, at its root core, like we believe it's going to make us like whole. So it's cutting through ignorance, which is just, it's, um, yeah. And so do you, do you know, like, what are the causing conditions that allow it to feel lighter? Like what's going on in your life or your day when it feels like a little lighter to be well that? uh now that you say that i uh, think that's exactly related because you know with i have the same i don't i don't want to say problem but i have a problem with uh, pastries <laughs> and sweet you know it's not a problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> so solution <laughs> so you know it was like this taking refuge in sweets was gone for a while yeah but then recently in the past couple of weeks i don't know what's happening like you know, there's this bar it's, I like, it's called Everbar, Evergreen, I don't know, it's a chocolate wafer. And, you know, like it's sitting there on the table or at work, it's everywhere. And then, <laughs> and then you know, I look at it and then I say, fuck it. And, and then I eat the whole thing and then I feel bad. Yeah. But yeah, it has been stressful. It has been unfulfilling. Yeah. And so maybe that's the underlying cause. So maybe yeah. I have to take care of other stuff. Yeah. 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 And then like not again, like, absolutely probably like i'll speak for myself i definitely eat too much sugar i'm not saying there's no problem with sugar but it's really our our like relationship with um it is it's funny it's like thinking we can sit down and meditate and that will alleviate all our problems if we go throughout the day like without being in right relationship with our work with other people you know like we can't like it actually has to be like really examining and understanding the way that we're holding our whole life yeah 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 thank you yeah yeah this is my unfulfilling i mean it was still pretty good also i think it was like i got a bad batch i don't know no, it was just like that i was in a foul mood or it really didn't taste as good um, <laughs> it's La Marseille, La Marseille, La Marseille. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah. Please, yeah. I like your hat. Yeah, it's funny. Huh? <laughs> My friend made it. Uh, hey, I'm Lucas. Um, Yeah. I mean, so, uh, kind of crave stuff my whole life. I think most people have, but you know, I was particularly, I've been sober 10 years. So like, it's a thing that became like a main focal point in my life, uh, at a certain point. Right. And, um, and you know, even 10 years later, um, you know, these new forms of it kind of come up as like, you know, sort of like 
I resolve other kind of like extreme behavioral patterns. Right. And, and, um, and lately I've been fixating on, uh, romantic, a romantic relationship that, uh, you know, I'm potentially, I'm going to, I'm going to share my feelings to this person that I'm friends with. And, uh, and I've been kind of obsessing about it because like, I, I realized that I had feelings for them and I, and I didn't really, you know, and then there was like a craving that like, I needed to like, sort of like absorb them. Right. Like I needed to like, like that they were, you know, and so, and that's not, you know, I, I know. So luckily I have a lot of people I can talk to about this and like how to sort of like, you know, whether it's selfish or not, you know, or, or what, but, um, I've noticed that even though I've like decided to, um, tell this friend of mine that, um, that I do have feelings for them, like to, to not have, um, well, I, you know, I'm not going to expect that there's no expectations, but like, I, I need a plan of action. Like yeah. I, I'm having a really hard time just like letting, letting this sit, um, without like having like, um, some sort of like decision matrix after, you know, whether I let it go, if they are not yeah. willing to be, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> planning to like integrate it, yeah. you know, whatever, um, or, uh, so, or, or, you know, maybe there's the other thing, who knows, but like, yeah. I, you know, so that's where I'm at. Like I, I'm at this point where like, yeah, if I'm craving something like, uh, usually like I need some, <laughs> there's something I have to do about it and like figuring out what that is. Like sometimes that comes internally or, um, it comes from like a lot of conversations with other people. Yeah. Um, that, and you know, I been calorie counting lately. And that okay. sucks. Yeah. So yeah, the can food I, thing is a big problem. Can I ask you, can I ask you one more question? Yeah. yeah. Just like, cause I, I love what you point out about craving, which is not all the time, but this like kind of obsessive cognitive desire to control the outcome. Yeah. Like, I feel like that can be a real harm hallmark of our craving. Like, you know, I want this thing, but if I don't get it, maybe this other way, or then that, like, there's so right. <laughs> like all this, like, uh, machinations of trying to control the outcome of what we want. And especially if it's not something we know we're going to get. Right. And it's a really, um, yeah. And, and you said you kind of went from a process of like catching yourself, like obsessing and then talking through it. And just curious, like, how, like, how can you hold it now? Like how, you know, how are you understanding it or how are you feeling in your body as you, as you think about it? Well, I think I'm, I'm not excited. Like, it's not about being excited that like, I'm going to get this thing because I know that that's not really like real, a realistic way to look at it. Right. Um, but it's more about, I, I, I guess I'm sort of excited about, um, something happening yeah right <laughs> instead yeah. of it just being inside of my head right right um and i don't know what that something is but it's yeah. just like i mean it could potentially you know just flamethrower the relationship but i don't yeah. think so yeah. yeah i think people like it when you know you're honest and and you know if they're not into it then you like hey well then i need some space or whatever yeah because whatever yeah it's, it's fizzle out in my brain yeah um but it sounds like what you're describing to me is going from the kind of, I know we overuse this word, but this is what he uses it. Like the ignorance of, I need this thing. So it's going to make me happy yeah. to like, Oh, this is exciting. Right. Yeah. Like that could be its own equanimity. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I guess that's where I'm sitting. Hopefully I can stay sitting in that where it, it doesn't matter. The, you know, the outcome is just an outcome that there's no weight to yeah. either uh, di direction something can go in. Um, yeah, I appreciate this, uh, group to yeah. share my, my, my stuff. We're with. rooting for you. <laughs> no expectation of outcome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, any, I mean, it's so, it's so tender to, to want, you know, and, and the craving and, it's not always unwholesome, right? Like wanting to pursue meaningful relationships. It's not like, Oh, cut that out. Pastries arguably are like definitely unwholesome, but they could have, you know, their benefit, but it is, 
it's interesting how we can kind of contort something that is just a natural part of um, our experience, like like wanting and have it be that like burning of craving. And um, yeah, it, and it is, I don't know about you all, like I, um, I'm not so much of a doom scroller, you know, like looking at stuff like that's not, but I, I sometimes fall into it. And in like the stupidest way, like I don't use so much social media, so I'll doom scroll surf line. And I think maybe Jimmy knows in here, like there's no content there. It's just like nothing but like someone getting barreled, someone getting, it's not that exciting. It is. <laughs> yeah. Getting barreled pretty good, but it's like, it's not, not really exciting, but I, I kind of check in, like, what am I really looking for? Like, what am I seeking? And it's connection and I'm not getting it. And I keep going. It's interesting. I don't know. It's interesting to watch our craving. Um, and I might have mentioned this, but hmm, the researcher um, Judson Brewer, who studies meditation and mindfulness and has actually studied craving quite a lot. Uh, he collaborated with really wonderful researcher here at UCSF, Ashley Mason, Mason, who's done a lot of research on um, healthy eating habits and otherwise. And he, Judson Brewer is like a, a Buddhist contemplative scientist. And he says the way he's been thinking about his research and interventions is drawn from this Buddhist saying of um, seeing pleasure till its end. So if you have a craving, you know, for, for in his case, he's talking about the cigarette, you know, so in the smoking cessation program, really like notice the entire experience of the cigarette, you know, and you start to notice like there's parts of it that are, are not good, you know, and like there's parts of it, like cigarettes are a really easy one because there's like taste and like other things that might not be good. But even with that um, beautiful flaky pastry, right? Like it's too sweet. Like, let's be honest, right? It's flaky everywhere. Like really like paying attention to your craving and like paying attention to what it feels like before the craving. And then almost maybe most importantly, like after, like paying full attention as the way to really understand and kind of unhook craving from this Buddhist perspective. So, yeah. Any like, questions or, or thoughts on this fire of our senses, this craving? Yeah, please. I mean, about the flakiness and being too sweet and all that stuff, you know, like, I mean, that's the problem with craving though, right? Because we do notice that. We do see the aftermath of it. And then, you know, next weekend, it's the same pastry. Yeah. Right. Why? <laughs> Why? You know, you, you, you remember the sugar hit, but you forget about the... Exactly. You know, the forgetting. The, the flakiness that was, you know, the, the becoming too sweet after that initial sugar hit. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. And that's why, right, we, we'd say, like, this is remembering, like, so much of the Buddhist practice is remembering. And yeah. Also, I'm not cutting my hair. Sorry, Buddha. <laughs> I don't think it's required unless you're a monastic. Uh, yeah. And I just think it's, you know, it's just so it's really humbling and, um, you know, craving and especially craving with substances that are mind altering, um, you know, it has so much damage, right? It hurts so much. Yeah. Oh, oh, hand up. Hello. Hi. 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 So I just would wanted to add that I noticed that um, it's very difficult to hold um, craving and gratitude and at the same mm. time, <clears throat> and that this um, this um, cultivation of present moment awareness is a uh, support for that but yeah I also wanted to add that that being said I do find the craving for relationship or intimate yeah. romantic relationship a particularly sticky one um I have been uh, I, I got divorced right before the pandemic and mm. so it's very tricky navigating how to do that again but I have lately been been finding some gratitude around this sort of um sanctuary um 
of practice that I have for myself right now and that I've created. Yes. But, um, and I am I am super grateful for that mm. um, and privileged to be able to do this. But um, but yeah, I did. The main thing I wanted to mention is that I noticed that it's it's a, a handy tool as a pivot point if I find that craving yeah. is getting me, uh, uh, yeah. getting hold of me. That I can say, wait a minute, you know, um, I love this thing and I don't have it right now, but I do have this. I do, yeah. I do yeah. have precious human life. I do have clean water mm. and um, yeah. safe to be. So uh. beautiful. That yeah, there's two things you said I, I really want to lift up and you know, gratitude or like an appreciative attention towards what's around us. It's so beneficial when we feel fear. And it makes me think, you know, that with craving, there can be some fear, right? Like, what if I don't get it? Or is it going to, is it going to be the right thing? And um, I think that's, that's really lovely. And then um, the other thing you were describing is, uh, oh my God, I might've forgotten it. Hmm. Oh yeah. Like, like where can we go um, or what can we identify as, as a kind of true refuge? Right. The, the craving is coming out of a fundamental belief that this moment is not a wonderful moment. Right. That moment will be wonderful, like not this. So kind of coming back fully to that, that beautiful, simple phrase of like just dwelling here and this being wonderful. And I don't want to make this sound simple. Um, it's so hard, you know, and last weekend I had like an hour or two where I can't even really tell why, but I experienced like greater anxiety than I have in like months and months and months. And I knew enough to know like, this isn't real, but I didn't think it was a wonderful moment, you know? And I just want us to be like honest, like this is so helpful and nourishing and it's not always available for us. And, you know, it passed it was like a really lame couple hours. And I was like, you know, dysregulated, um, and then it passed. Right. And it's, it's, I just want to be, yeah, I feel like sometimes it's like, yep, well in the moment, it's wonderful. We're good. Go, go, <laughs> go forth. Um, but it's not, it's, it can be harder and really tricky. So I'm just grateful we get to do this together. Um, I can't believe, yeah, that tonight went really quickly, but let's take a moment and, um, Dedicate our merit. So coming back to dwelling in this in this breath, and finding this moment to be a wonderful moment. And really remembering and reconnecting with the ultimate ground of our practice, which is bodhicitta, the awakened heart. And dedicating every and any part of our heart that has been opened this evening to the greater purpose that all beings could know their true nature, that all beings could experience freedom from pain and suffering, and that all beings could be truly free. Really great to be here together. <clears throat> Truly thank all of you for your wisdom. Some of you who shared your wisdom, others of you who are just here with your wisdom. Um, we are a volunteer run center. Uh, many of the volunteers are here tonight and online. You can raise your hand. We love you. Thank you. And everything and anything you can do to support the center to keeping open really helps us. 
There's a lot of different ways to donate uh, online and in person. Are we also still looking for volunteers? Always. 